I'm Maribel Tarouk. Tonight, a 17-year-old girl is recovering after a lunchtime shooting in Brampton. When officers arrived on scene, they located a youth suffering from an apparent gunshot wound. The shooting putting a number of area schools in lockdown and hold insecure. We'll have the latest from the scene and... Things like security and paid duty officers are essential and super important. Those are really areas that we can't skimp on. We're taking a look at how the increased costs of security could affect a number of major events this summer. Plus... The ability for the city to develop park in the future, what we're calling the Opportunity Lands, is really subject to negotiations ongoing now. What was once envisioned to be a huge downtown park could become a massive condo development with added green space. But at what cost to the city? Good evening. Police in Hamilton Township, just north of Coburg, are investigating the death of a toddler who went missing from a licensed daycare yesterday. It happened just after 5 o'clock as many parents were arriving to pick up their kids. Greg Ross has the latest. This mother dropped off a teddy bear and pictures that her children drew at this makeshift memorial. Both of her children go to the Watch Me Grow daycare where a little girl died yesterday. This woman says one of her children played with that little girl regularly. She was just like sunshine, like she was always smiling, she was always happy. Nearby residents tell us that just after 5 o'clock yesterday, frantic workers from the daycare were going door to door telling them that a little girl had gone missing and asking if they had seen her. We started looking, checked my ravine that's in behind, checked my whole property. There must have been a hundred of us all along here checking our backyards. There must have been at least 10 or 12 police cars out there, a fire department uh, came in, other people uh, seemed to be driving by, stopping, also joining the search. Not long after that search began, it ended tragically. One man who helped in that search but did not want to be identified told us that the body of that little girl was found in a well behind the daycare. Just a tragic, tragic situation. I have, uh, you know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and uh, sure, I mean, that's devastating. Local police have yet to share any details about their investigation into this little girl's death, leaving people here with more questions than answers. Who was responsible for this child, and uh, how did she get away on her own? Parents with children at the daycare are now questioning their own kids' safety. Could have been him. And it makes me angry. It makes me angry as a parent that I didn't look into where they were playing. I didn't look at the dangers. The daycare itself has been closed until further notice as police continue their investigation on the property. Greg Ross, CBC News, Hamilton Township. An early morning car crash in Brampton has left a woman dead. It happened around 2.30 this morning at the intersection of Bramley Road and Sandalwood Parkway. Police say two vehicles collided with one ending up on its roof. The driver of that vehicle died at the scene. The driver of the other car was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Police are asking anyone with dash cam video or information about the crash to contact them. York police have released new information about an early morning shooting outside a Vaughn recording studio earlier this week. They say they now believe this was a targeted shooting. Police were called to a plaza near Highway 7 West just before 4 a.m. on Wednesday. Two men were found suffering from gunshot wounds. One of them was pronounced dead at the scene. That victim has now been identified as 23-year-old Jaden Pitter of Brampton. The other victim was rushed to a trauma center and is in stable condition. Police are now looking for two suspects described as wearing dark clothing at the time of the shooting. They have also released an image of a dark colored SUV believed to be the suspect vehicle. Police say there were several people in the area during the shooting and are asking anyone with information to contact them. Former Unifor President Jerry Diaz will not face charges after Toronto Police investigation into whether he accepted a bribe. The investigation started last spring after Unifor handed over $50,000 Diaz allegedly accepted from a supplier of COVID-19 rapid test kits. Diaz entered rehab after the incident, saying his use of painkillers 
sleeping pills and alcohol to deal with a sciatic nerve issue had impaired his judgment. Diaz now says the conclusion of the investigation will, quote, reinforce what I have always known to be true, that over a, my 45-year career, I have consistently acted with integrity and in the best interests of UNIFOR members. There's a new plan for the Downtown Toronto Railway Corridor that former Mayor John Tory once envisioned as a giant park. Developers want to cover the rail lines and build more than 6,000 condo units. They're also dangling the possibility that part of the site could become parkland. But as senior reporter Mike Crawley reports, it comes at a price. Today, it's a busy stretch of rail lines slicing through the western edge of downtown Toronto. Here, developers have a vision for the future. Nine condo towers on the site, with two of them rising to more than 60 stories. That's higher than the tallest tower in the well development, just north of the rail lines. Building on top of a, a, an active rail corridor and an active rail maintenance yard isn't as simple as building on solid ground. It's the same site that the city wanted to cover and transform into the so-called Rail Deck Park. That plan got shot down two years ago when a provincial tribunal ruled in favour of the developers who own the rights to build over the rail lines. An unelected, unaccountable provincial tribunal made a ruling that allowed now for development to happen here. The site stretches from Bather Street to Blue Jays Way. The developers are proposing to give this portion to the city as a park. They're also suggesting these two parcels could become parkland as well, but at a price. The developers aren't saying publicly how much. The ability for the city to develop park in the future, what we're calling the opportunity lands, is really subject to negotiations ongoing now. I'm fighting to get as much of this development to be that public and green space as possible, publicly accessible green space. The cost will almost certainly run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Back in 2020, the developers made public an offer to sell the city the park portion of the rail deck site for $340 million price the developers called substantially less than fair market value. The, the costs associated with delivery of a, a deck and park are, are pretty significant. The Rail Deck District proposal is making its way through City Hall right now, but it won't come before Council for a vote until after the new mayor gets elected next month. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. So, Colette, I think weekend plans are going to involve a lot of outside activities. Yeah, I certainly hope that they do because we definitely are going to be seeing the weather conditions for it. And over the next few days, not only will it be dry, so sunny and mild, the dew points will be relatively low. So we won't really be feeling it being sticky. Now, things will change with that as the humidity will go up as we get into next week. So just enjoy this weekend. Now, to kind of compare things for uh, today, Normal high 21, a normal low 11, and we did pretty well with that high, a little warmer than the last couple of days. Still, it was a cool start. We've got another night where I expect our overnight lows to be in the single digits, but then after that, those are really going to be warming up too, and we'll have double digits, and you won't be needing to worry so much about your garden because of the cold conditions. It'll be how dry it's going to be after several days of this. So daytime highs, with a few exceptions because of the lake influence, from the winds, you know, you see just so many readings, 20, 21, 22 across all of southern Ontario. The current temperatures are holding pretty close to that, but in terms of anything to be found here, here this ridge of high pressure just carving the skies out with clear and dry conditions. But as that ridge slides a little bit further east over top of this low, we get into a blocking pattern, and that's why things are going to be lasting like this for so long and only seeing the heat building. When I come back, I'll explain all of that, Maribel. Okay, heat building, I'm not mad at that. No, okay. <laughs> dry okay. heat building. Mm. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. A 17-year-old girl has been shot with a replica firearm. It happened over the lunch hour at a Brampton Plaza. Patrick Swadden has more from the scene tonight. 
Maryville, I'm just outside a small plaza in Brampton near Central Park Drive and Grenoble Avenue. Peel police are saying that they were called here around 1130 AM this morning for what they deemed a weapons dangerous call. Now, when they arrived, they found a victim suffering from gunshot wounds. We spoke to Constable Sarah Patton with Peel police. Here's what she had to say. When officers arrived on scene, they located a youth suffering from an apparent gunshot wound. The youth was taken to a local hospital and their injuries have since been deemed non life threatening. Now, Peel police were initially reporting that that victim was 13 years old. They're now reporting that she is, in fact, 17 years old. They're also saying they think they know who the suspect is, that he's a student, but they do not have him in custody at this time. They're also saying they can't confirm whether the suspect and victim knew each other. But we spoke to an employee of the Pizza Pizza here. Here's what she had to say. Um, they had an argument, so she was holding the, uh, the door. And then the, I think her friend, a friend, they have an argument, and then she just he just passed by her, and she's about to get into the store, so he just took up the gun and shot her leg, shot her leg, and then she uh, walked a couple steps, and she uh, collapsed in here. Now, Lai said that she ran to a nearby walk-in clinic and was able to get a doctor who was able to assist the victim. Peel police are also saying now that the weapon that was used was actually a replica weapon. We also heard from Peel District School Board who say that many of the nearby schools went into hold and uh, secure, including one uh, that went into full lockdown. Now, that was Judith Nyman Secondary School. It's believed that that is where the suspect attends school. Now, police are urging that suspect to turn himself in and seek legal counsel, but until he does, he is considered armed and dangerous. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Brampton. Yesterday, we told you about Pride Toronto potentially scaling back its plans this year due to skyrocketing costs, including for policing and insurance. Today, other major events from music to food festivals say they're facing the same issues. Talia Ricci finds out what impact that will have this summer. It's the music, dancing and flurry of colours that the Caribbean Carnival's Grand Parade brings to Toronto. This year, attendees can still expect all of the sparkle that comes with the event, but behind the scenes, budgeting is a challenge. Since the pandemic, the landscape for the event and festival space has changed dramatically. Um, we're seeing an increase of 40% in some areas for some of our resources. Some of the big price tags include insurance, security, supplies and paid duty police officers. Contributing to that increase is a jump of over 14% in the hourly rate of pay for officers to perform paid duty. The Toronto Police Association said last year almost 40% of paid duties went unfilled, leaving events and contractors without the officers they needed. So they raised the rates as an incentive. Things like security and paid duty officers are essential and super important to the safe and secure running of our events. So those are really areas that we can't skimp on, but we are feeling it. So are the summer food festivals. Taste of the Danforth, for example, says their paid duty officer costs are up 30%, while their programming and production costs have increased up to 50%. The Festival of South Asia says they're asking the government for more funding. Every year we try to bring new things to the festival for people to experience South Asian culture, but also kind of, you know, appeals to a larger audience. Um, and we, we have some brilliant ideas, but it's just so difficult to kind of think, how are we going to, to deliver that in, in reality? The live music industry is feeling the pinch too, especially as it tries to bounce back from the pandemic astronomical increases in some cases and uh, again you add that to the the cost of other parts of doing business and and you have a, a pretty significant problem coupled with the fact that all of the the you know the COVID supports and um offerings to a small business etc you know are long gone and we're also seeing a decrease in in government grants that some of these festivals may have been able to access these organizations along with destination toronto say the best way to ensure the city's summer fund continues growing is to show your support these events are integral to the vibrancy and inclusiveness that's so key to Toronto and who we are and what our identity is and why visitors come here. 
folks should get out and enjoy and remember these festivals worked really hard to get to this point. The Festival of South Asia and events like Festival of South Asia play a very important role in actual human connections in bringing communities together. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. The mayor of Richmond Hill is addressing some controversial moves the province has made recently. David West responded to the province's plans to break up neighboring Peel region by saying he believes York region is different. He also shared his thoughts on the premier's recent comments about the possibility that the Greenbelt may be opened up for further development. Lorenda Redekop has that story. Richmond Hill is growing, though at around 200,000 people, is much smaller than Brampton or Mississauga, the cities at the center of the Peel breakup. Speeding up housing approvals is a reason the province gave for splitting it up. So what does the mayor think of that possibility for York? I think York Region's situation is quite different than, than Peel's. He says some form of a regional body works for services such as police, public health and water. I think there is a, uh, a role for a coordinating body like the region, um, but um, you know we will be looking at, at, at that at the region and, and with the pr provincial facilitator to see you know what future form does that take. There are some efficiencies that we can find and, and make things better than they are. I'm certainly happy to do it. The facilitator he mentioned is expected to be appointed soon by the province for York Region, as well as ones for five other regions being looked at. In a recent statement, the chair of York Region notes this is a part of the province that's growing, set to hit more than 2 million people by 2051. He says he welcomes the opportunity to work with the province and also all nine towns and cities that make up the region, particularly when it comes to meeting their housing pledges. Richmond Hill includes some Greenbelt land. We also asked West about the Premier's recent comments on the Greenbelt. A failed policy, a flawed policy from the Liberal government. A bunch of staffers randomly got a highlighter and went up and down roads. They were going through golf courses, through buildings. It was, it was just a big scam. Though Ford has promised he wouldn't allow building on ponds or wetlands. I would not be uh, uh, open to seeing that uh, those important protected areas eroded. Um, and you know, I guess the thing is that I, I don't believe in Richmond Hill we need it to, in order to, to, uh, uh, to meet our housing goals. CBC Toronto reached out to the mayors of the region's other larger cities, Markham and Vaughan. So far, we've received no response on whether they'd like a split. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Richmond Hill. On the Toronto mayoral campaign trail, it was a week filled with platform pitches and candidates confronting one another. Key debates were held about vital issues facing the city, but there was one that may not have been as thoroughly discussed as some voters may have wanted. How the city is going to bridge a billion-dollar budget shortfall. It was part of my conversation, though, with our municipal affairs reporter, Sean Jeffords. So, Sean, this week, it seems like voters had plenty of opportunity to really hear sure did. from the candidates. Like, a lot of opportunity. The debates really rolled on this week. Yeah, they ran the gauntlet, these six top polling candidates. So, they had four debates in under 48 hours. and That's they a lot. Were, they, yeah, yeah, I mean, think about that just in terms of talking. They're talking to each other, at each other, sometimes over each other for conservatively speaking, almost eight hours. And yeah. that's some of it's on TV. It's really high stress. And I think we got our best look at them under pressure that we have so far in this campaign. So what emerged for you um, in these debates that uh, did anyone really distinguish themselves? Did anyone surprise you? Uh, did anyone come out with something you weren't expecting? You know, I think that the thing that surprised me the most is that Mark Saunders really became the focal point for a lot of the attacks. And, you know, I think that is really owing to this almost quasi endorsement we've seen from Premier Doug Ford. So Ford hasn't come right out and said those words, but he's sort of hinted in the past couple of weeks that, you know, there's a certain type of candidate that's needed and it's not, you know, a left leaning candidate and it's not a free spender. It's someone who's run a big organization and who's leaning a little more to the right of the political spectrum, well, that's Mark Saunders. So, you know, he was the focus of these attacks, and I think largely because of that. And Olivia Chow, who is the front runner, really kind of faded back. And I think that's probably to her strategic benefit. So that was one of my main takeaways from those events. 
there's a lot of discussion um, and a lot of the main topics emerge that we've identified already. Right. Uh, housing, uh, affordability, all of these things. But it struck me that there was a really big issue that maybe didn't get a lot of discussion in these debates, and that is the massive budget shortfall that City Hall is under. That's right, Mirabelle. I mean, the, the, not, not for lack of trying, I should say. Okay, I yeah. mean, it was the first question in the Toronto Region Board of Trade debate. I mean, they were trying to get a lot of fiscal policy out of these candidates, and it did get a little bit of airtime there, really within the first few minutes. And there were some varying degrees of attention paid to what is a huge problem for the city. And I mean, depending on where you kind of do the math, it could be a billion to a billion and a half that uh, we're, we're sort of in the hole here at the city of Toronto, that budget gap that comes from COVID-19 and is kind of exacerbating a problem that existed already, which is all of these services from the province and the federal government that have been downloaded to the city over the past number of decades that really have been a consistent problem. So the candidates were looking at this and they're sort of saying we need a new fiscal deal, but I think they don't really want to talk about the other elephant in the room, which is how much property taxes will have to be increased by and if we need new fees, new service fees that frankly will help pay for some of this shortfall. So there's a whole issue of this relationship that the city will have to have with the province. It's inextricable. Absolutely. Um, so what have you been hearing from the candidates in terms of what kind of mayor they're going to be in terms of having this relationship that should be constructive with the province? Well, I think it's, it is kind of a central debate around who you select as the new mayor and how they will relate to the provinces, specifically Doug Ford. You know, Mark Saunders is trying to pitch himself as the guy who, frankly, has the rapport. He can go up and he can talk with the premier and he can do things and negotiate deals for the city. Now, you've got Josh Matlow on the other side of things saying, look, like what's what's been happening before really wasn't working. And Mayor John Tory's approach was too conciliatory. Matlow is saying, listen, I'll praise the Premier when he deserves it, but I will fight him for the City of Toronto when that is deserved too. And you've got other candidates trying to weave a bit more of a diplomatic approach. I think Olivia Chow, Anna Bailao, Brad Bradford, Nancy Hunter, they're all trying to kind of say, yeah, I'll fight when I need to fight, but I'll also be diplomatic and try to negotiate with governments when, when we need to. Ooh. So. It is a fine line. You know, you do have to have relationships with these governments. There's no way around it. So it was really the debates that were a big focus for this week. Look ahead for us to next week. What are you expecting? What are we going to see? Well, we will see a couple more debates, but I actually think that the focus will shift a bit to real direct outreach to uh, from campaigns to voters. I mean, on June 1st, campaigns can start to put up signs. You're going to start to see advertising. You know, there's going to be a real ramp up in that air war, and it'll really draw to a bit of a crescendo within the last two weeks of the campaign, Ooh. where the votes are going to, they're going to try to consolidate them around the, their preferred candidate, these campaigns, and they're going to spend a lot of money, millions potentially, trying to woo voters and just get attention, just break through in this race. Still a lot more to watch for. We got about a month? About a month, okay. yes. All right. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Mirabelle. Canada's Walk of Fame is continuing to grow with 11 new inductees. The special ceremony marked the 25th anniversary of the Walk of Fame. We are excited about envisioning a more impactful and a more interactive garden of achievement around these important stars in the ground in the heart of downtown Toronto. Imagine 25 years ago, right here, our city was different. Our world was different. Movie star Keanu Reeves, singer Julie Black, and retired professional wrestler Bret Hart were among the big names recognized Friday. They're part of the Walk of Fame's class of 2020-2021. The special ceremony also honored actor Graham Greene, singer-songwriter Bruce Coburn, and track and field star Damian Warner. They are all now part of a group of 200 Canadians inducted over the past 25 years into Canada's Walk of Fame. Toronto will be the site of one giant open house this weekend. Doors Open Toronto is back for the first time since the COVID pandemic, with first stop at Billy Bishop Airport.
We're participating for the first time since 2019, uh, opening our doors, uh, granting behind the scenes access to people. Uh, they get to see uh, some of our maintenance vehicles, our fire vehicles. Uh, there's a viewing platform area for plane spotting. Um, and lots of our partners are participating. You can have access to the Orange Hangar and see some of their aircraft and vehicles. Uh, super exciting day, lots to see and do. This year's theme, City of Sound, focuses on what a city sounds like. The airport is just one of 150 sites that will be open for visitors to explore. The citywide event, meant to celebrate architecture and public spaces, highlights some of Toronto's most culturally significant buildings. That includes the R.C. Harris Water Treatment Plant and the Spadina Museum. It's also offering rare access to City Hall's Council Chamber and its Observation Deck. The weekend-long event will run from 10 to 5 at most sites with scheduled musical performances, workshops and short film screenings. The Canada Revenue Agency is boosting its funding for organizations that host free tax clinics. It's meant to help more Canadians with modest income file their returns for free. But there's also a renewed push to make filing taxes automatic. Anise Hedari explains. The federal government says it wants the Canadians who should be getting tax breaks to actually get them. But that means for a lot of Canadians, taxes have to get filed. So the government is increasing the money it pays to nonprofit clinics to help people do their taxes for free. Those clinics are often staffed by volunteers. You, you tell them that they, uh, they, you are eligible for, for these benefits, you need to do this and that, and you don't need to pay. This is like a, a free from, uh, they are so happy. In particular, when they help individuals who haven't filed taxes for a number of years, uh, those individuals can now finally get access to fundamental benefits and credits that they weren't getting access to before. The government has also said it wants to come up with ways to make filing taxes automatic, as in individuals wouldn't have to do it, but the federal government themselves gets your taxes figured out. Researchers have said it should be possible and that more people would get the money governments have already budgeted as a result. In my opinion, the pilot program is not necessary. They can do this. Our, our research suggests that two-thirds of social assistance recipients have returns that CRA could complete today. The new grants for free tax clinics will triple the money the federal government pays to organizations that file 50 or more tax returns. As for when or if automatic tax filing becomes a reality, that's still in the works, with a pilot project expanding next year. Any Sedari, CBC News, Calgary. The federal government says it's bringing in immigration measures to help reunite more families and faster. It includes a new way to speed up the application process itself. Many call the changes much needed and long overdue. Olivia Stefanovic has the details. I think these measures are going to benefit not just newcomers to Canada, but everyone who calls this country home. The immigration minister announcing new measures to streamline a family reunification system under criticism for keeping too many loved ones apart. Families are stronger when they're together and we want to help them unite and prosper here. To achieve that goal, Ottawa is introducing a new open work permit for spousal and family class applicants and extending permits for those who already have one for an additional 18 months. It's um, exciting and amazing news. This immigration lawyer says the move is long overdue. It's definitely going to have an impact on, on families' ability to be reunited sooner rather than later. I think it's a step in the, in the right direction, certainly. Others want the federal government to go even further by waiving a requirement for applicants to promise to leave Canada by a hard deadline. So it can be a very onerous requirement that is very difficult to overcome. I swear. I swear. Ottawa is dealing with a mountain of backlogs caused in part by the pandemic and recent international conflicts. The immigration system is broken. Um, it, there's a two million application backlog that hasn't changed. I was just looking at it a few days ago. So this is an announcement that's patchworking a problem. Ottawa is also introducing new processing tools to improve wait times. But for some waiting for their spouses to come to Canada, today's announcement doesn't inspire much confidence. I don't see any added advantage unless we know how long it's going to take or 
at least get an estimation. The government says it's using new technology to identify applicants who have a high likelihood of having their permanent residency approved. The immigration minister says the move has worked in 90% of cases so far. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Some stunning video now from South Korea showing the frightening moments in a plane when a passenger suddenly cranked open the emergency door. The jet was about 200 meters in the air at the time, just minutes from landing when the emergency door was pulled open. A howling wind blew through the cabin. Fortunately, all passengers were wearing seat belts at the time. Nine people had to be taken to hospital. Officials say no one was seriously injured. The airline says the passenger was only able to open the door because the plane was close to landing, meaning the air pressure inside and outside was almost the same. The passenger is now in police custody. Yeah, that plane situation, super scary. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just can't even imagine. I'm I'm waiting to hear what the reason, what the reason uh -huh. was. But yep. you know, it there can't be a good one. So I'm just curious. Uh, very scary stuff there. All right, this isn't necessarily scary at all, but what it is is an explainer of what's going on with our weather pattern. And we are going to be seeing for several days conditions where it's sunny during the day, it's mild, mild at night, and dry conditions. Uh, nice for the weekend, but after several days and by the time we get towards uh, the end of next week, we're going to really be looking for some rain showers. But with the setup here, you get an area of low pressure. This is an upper low and it's kind of cut off from the circulation when a strong ridge sets up right above it. And so this north to south situation here, the jet streams going around any weather patterns that are kind of trying to come in from west to east have to go all the way around. And this is why we see very little activity when you're under that part of the ridge and the Great Lakes are and we will be experiencing that. Uh, headed into a holiday weekend, though, there will be some folks in the mid-Atlantic region that aren't too happy uh, because they're going to see several days here of heavy rain just because it kind of that low gets stuck there. And even once that starts to dissipate, they're still going to have cloud cover there. But notice how none of this, it tries to move nor north and just can't penetrate where that ridge of high pressure is with the sinking air and the very stable conditions. So our temperatures tonight, we have clear skies. And again, we are looking at those readings being in the single digits. But I do want to caution you that after tonight, we're going to see even our overnight lows in the double digits and the daytime highs will be climbing. Now it's comfortable for the next couple of days, but as we get into next week, we're going to find the humidity going up as well. So I'll start talking to you about Humidex values, but just sunny through the period, dry. And as I do look ahead into early June, Maybe a chance of showers at the end of next week, but even at that, at this point, Miraville, it looks like a slim one. So we'll be definitely watering some plants and really uh, needing to look at these kinds of things by then. Mm -hmm. As we bask in the in the sunshine and the warmth, I guess, yes, too. Yes, yeah. so these are these trade-offs, right? That's it, that's the thing. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. Okay. Thin mints, chocolate, vanilla, Girl Guide cookies are a staple of any sweet tooth diet. The money going to fund Girl Guides of Canada and its many youth programs. But as Patrick Swadden explains, some will stop at nothing to get their hands on a box. Who can resist a Girl Guide cookie? Answer, no one. From time to time, you might even find yourself pinching one from a colleague. But would you steal a trunk full of them? I'm a Girl Guide leader. Well, that's what this Girl Guides leader says happened earlier this week outside her Parkdale home. Of so many other things that could be taken, why Girl Guide cookies? What are you going to do with them? A neighbor's security footage shows a man pull into the alley behind Cabral's house. He tries a few garage and car doors before breaking onto her property from the front. He opened the gates. Cabral says the thief forced his way through her front gate to the garage. He pulled it open because it hadn't latched properly when I closed it. That's where the thief found Cabral's car. He walked to my car, I guess. Tossing her belongings about, 
before opening the trunk and finding its sugary loot. All 12 he took out of my trunk and put into his car. But leaving behind bikes, pressure washers, all sorts of more valuable yeah. equipment. The suspect then escapes out back, taking off with the biscuity bounty. And the value of those cookies? $870. Wow. Cabral says she reported the theft to police on Wednesday. Using security footage, they were able to track down a suspect in possession of the cookies within hours. Toronto police say they've made an arrest, but won't release any details about the thief. And the cookies? They may have needed them for the future. Not for eating, but for evidence. But later on, some good news. I received a phone call from 11 Division, and they said that we could go pick up the cookies. But that's not the end of the story. Each case has 12 boxes in them they smelt like smoke she says this might mean they can't sell some of them and that matters because it could hurt her unit's fundraising efforts the money from sold cookies going to all sorts of youth programs without the cookies without this fundraising opportunity this kind of programming wouldn't be available she says selling the cookies also helps the girls bond and learn valuable life lessons, a lesson this thief clearly missed. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. As we head to break, here's a look at where the markets closed out the week. The TSX rose 146 points, the Dow climbed 328, and the dollar traded up to 73.41 cents US. We'll be right back. If you've taken the GO train recently, you may have heard a fun voice over the intercom. It's a train crew member who will say just about anything to get passengers to crack a smile. On behalf of myself and the operating crew, we'd like to thank you for choo choosing GO Transit and hope you have a lovely trip. Hi, I'm Aaron Laranjo. I'm known for my, my horrible, horrible sense of humor and dad jokes. My apologies, folks. We've stopped this train because we've run out of gas. I'm just kidding. These trains run on diesel, not gasoline. We're most likely stopped for a green light to proceed into the station. We'll update you when we have more information. Good morning. I never got jokes, like, as a passenger myself. I would commute to and from every single day. When I joined, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be a little different. I tried it, and that's where the jokes come from, and I think I, I hit some gold with it, and I rolled with it. <laughs> I hope you folks at the front of the train enjoyed that little door chime remix I gave you. You can find that on my SoundCloud. I'm just kidding, Spotify is way better. I'm very much aware that I'm maybe the first or last face that a lot of people see in their day. So if I'm able to get them to smile or laugh or at least like sarcastically roll their eyes, it's bringing a light to the, again, the start or end of their day. And keeping with personal tradition, I'll end this day off with one of my infamous eye rolling dad jokes. Yay. What concert costs 45 cents? 50 cent featuring Nickelback. Have a good day, everybody. Yep, that's a dad joke, all right. <laughs> I think that just probably really does brighten up folks' days. Though. And I've noticed um, a few people like that, too, at Pearson, trying to move the, the lines along and keep people smiling. So, hey, whatever it takes. <laughs> and just having a look at these temperatures, I want to show you how, you know, we're in the 1920 range over here, but all of this heat that's building to the west. And so as this ridge of high pressure and it's going to be around a while, but as it slowly migrates to the east and we get on the back side of it, so the southerly flow, we'll find our temperatures really warming up. For tonight, it's 7. For tomorrow, it's 23. And then dry conditions through the period and that warming trend coming into next week. Hey, isn't that a nice way to go into the weekend then? It, it certainly is. It's Enjoy looking very yours. good. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. And that's our show for you tonight. Thanks for joining us. Chris Glover has your next local news tonight at 11 after the National. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good night.